Good afternoon, everyone. I think this has been a very uh, hopeful week across this country, certainly here in Ohio, uh, with the news about the vaccine coming. Uh, we're very excited about that. We hope to see this beginning in December. Uh, hope to start getting it out in December uh, to our most vulnerable population. And then as soon as it gets here, uh, going to come in batches. And as soon as these batches come, we're going to get it out. Um, but until then, we have to wait and we have to continue to battle this, this virus. Uh, you'll see by today's numbers um, that things are getting worse uh, and they're just going up at a, at a huge, huge rate. So we've got to get control of this. Uh, we've got to really focus on it. I, I quoted a quote attributed uh, to Winston Churchill uh, last night that when you're going through hell, keep going. And that's what we've got to do. Um, this is a time when we've got to kind of regroup and say we can get through this. Um, I'm not a marathon runner. Some of my kids have run marathons, but uh, you know they tell me when you get well into it, you know, think I've already done all this, uh, but I got, I got a ways to go. And that's maybe in some respects, the toughest, the toughest time. Uh, so, but we can do this. Uh, we will, in fact, do it. Um, some people have asked me today, well, what's the takeaway from last night's speech? And, you know, I think that really is it. It's hope. Um, we're going to get through this. There is light at the end. We can see the spring coming. We can see the sun coming up. We're just not there yet. And we got to get there. And we got to get there. Um, and save as many lives as we can. We've got to get there, uh, keep our economy moving, uh, keep our kids in school. These are all the things that are goals um, that we have to stay focused on. And it remains the most important thing that we can do and the thing that will really matter the most is, frankly, if we're careful and we wear a mask, um, we just have to continue to, to do that. So some of the things we talked about last night are really kind of focused on that. Uh, I talked about uh, how important it is for a worker uh, in a retail store um, to be sure 
that they are as safe as they can be. And for us to ensure that, we have to make sure that everyone that comes in uh, to that store is in fact wearing, wearing a mask. Now look, there's, I got questions during the night, um, text to me, emails, or is, is there exception for medical exceptions? Well, certainly, uh, you know, every mask order that we put out has medical exceptions. So I wanna assure everybody, but it's important for that worker who has to work uh, that they be protected. It's equally important for someone who's going out shopping uh, that they know that no matter what store they walk into, people there are going to be wearing masks. That's very, very, very important. We talked last night about, uh, sadly, some of the tragedy that has come out of banquets, come out of weddings, come out of uh, funerals. Uh, not the events themselves, but rather the party, the coming together. Uh, horrible, horrible tragedies. Uh, and, and we've got to slow those down. Uh, we're not telling people, you know, don't have a celebration. Uh, that's individual's choice. I know some people are postponing those until it's over with, and they're going to have an even better celebration. Uh, and you certainly could do that. But if people want to have the celebration, they can do it. But, you know, we're going to put out the, the basic guidelines, and they're going to be exactly what I think we all know. Wear a mask. Um, you know, if it's, if it's uh, a banquet, a wedding reception, and you're going to actually have that, Okay, uh, but people need to follow kind of the rules that we see in restaurants that we put in regard to restaurants and as people, people remain seated. Uh, you know, people not congregate really uh, very close together. Just the basic cautions. Um, it's not worth someone's life. It's not worth someone dying. Uh, we can do things, but we got to do them in a very, very careful, careful way. We also talk about bars and restaurants. Now, of course, I expected, I've got a lot of uh, feedback in regard to bars and restaurants. Look, we've not made a final decision on that. We're gonna be guided by a lot by what our hospitals are telling us, because this is a really a critical, a critical point. Um, we're seeing some real increases in the hospitals. We'll look at the numbers here in a minute. We'll make that decision as we get closer to it. People say, why restaurants? Why bars? Why not this? Why not that? Why not that? I understand that. The answer to that is this. It's winter, late fall, getting colder, not a bad day today, but people are moving, obviously moving inside. Uh, it makes any inside activity more difficult, more dangerous, potentially. Uh, what's unique about bars and restaurants, as, as well as fitness centers, uh, it is for a great deal of time, people are not wearing masks. We understand that you can't, can't eat and have a mask on or drink, but we also know people there sometimes for a long time. And so it's the time, what we've learned is it's the time, it's not wearing the mask. This is what raises the risk, makes it much, much more risky. So we'll have more of that. Uh, we'll see where these numbers go. Uh, but what my hope is, from last night and all our other discussions and just people seeing what's, what's really going on in Ohio. My hope, my prayer uh, is that we all will be more careful, we'll all wear masks more. Uh, and if we do, I think the evidence shows we can slow this down. We can in fact, turn this around. So let's, uh, Michael, let's look at the numbers. Uh, today's daily numbers, Sadly, continuing our growing trend, and you'll see on the numbers, we'll get them up here in a moment, uh, cases. So now we're over 7,100, and you can see the 21-day average is 4,000. So over 7,000 cases, um, a, new, a new high, uh, deaths 34, Hospitalizations 268. Again, both of these numbers, as you see, are larger than the 21-day average. Uh, ICU admissions are not. They're about the same at 21. But uh, obviously, we don't like to see that number. Um, we have our. This was, gave us our second uh, highest day of hospital admissions, with 286 people getting admitted to the hospital. Um, let's go to the our 88 counties slide. Um, again, this, this is a slide that if, if you want to know what 
the danger level is in your county right now. This is the best slide to look at. You can see, sadly, because it's, it is the color blue, every single county in Ohio now, every single county is a high incidence county. And if you go back down here to the bottom, Carroll County, even Carroll County at the lowest number is almost two times um, what the CDC says uh, is a high incidence level. So it's double high incident level, even for our lowest county. Michael, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is the top, again, the top 20. And again, when you look at these numbers, uh, Putnam County, these are just astronomical numbers, Mercer County, Auglaize, Allen, uh, Defiance, Miami. Um, these counties up in the northern part of the state, northwest part of the state, uh, very, very high, even down to Miami is six times the high incidence level. So these are indicators uh, of what is going on uh, directly in the county as far as the, as far as the spread. Michael, let's go to the next slide. Uh, the next few slides have to do with really what are, is coming up. These are the what I would call the predictor slides. And again, uh, not good news. COVID-related uh, outpatient visits, seven-day average, you're seeing right here what is, what is going on in regard to that. Um, trend is similar to those we're seeing for case counts uh, in our hospitals. Um, <clears throat> COVID-related emergency department visits. Take a look at, at that one. Um, Graph shows a seven-day moving average of covered or late emergency department visits. Graph on the left shows ED visits with a diagnosis of COVID-like symptoms. Graph on the right shows the number of emergency department visits with a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19. Both graphs show an alarming trend in our emergency departments are facing more cases than they have during this entire pandemic. Again, these are the warning signs, not good. Let's turn to the daily hospitalization and ICU admissions by date reported. These fill in. Um, they fill in as by date of actual admission because that data is not always available. Uh, the blue line shows the number of patients hospitalized with COVID-19. The orange line indicates the number of COVID-19 diagnosed patients that are in intensive care unit. As you can see, we are currently at our highest point for both hospitalized and ICU patients since the beginning of the pandemic. Let me go to the next slide. <clears throat> we often hear people say that the increase in cases, all that's just caused by more testing and we are having more testing. But as you can see from the slide, uh, increase in testing is here. See what's happened there. Uh, this one, however, is an increase, increase in cases. And you're, what you're seeing is a, a rather dramatic increase here, uh, a good increase here, but not anything like, like that. This is the 20th week of the Ohio Public Health Advisory uh, System. And Michael, let's go to the next slide on that. And this shows last week to this week. Uh, again, a couple things to note, more counties red, now down to only one yellow. Uh, the whole state is basically pretty much filling in uh, with this exception here and a couple here uh, with, with red. Uh, so again, I would advise people, you're in a red county, whatever county you're in, look at the slide we showed you before, which is how many cases uh, there are. Michael, let's go to the next one. We'll go to the next slide. Um, again, this is where this is where we are today. Um, we designed this system really to give a good indication of what was coming. Uh, but when most everything in Ohio is filled in, um, the value probably of these color code is not really as as significant. Um, getting to the purple. Uh, indicates, and we're not the purple, although we have two counties that have the, the uh, alarm signal put up that they could be going there next week. That is really an indication directly of what's going on with, with our hospitals. So two things really to look at now, number of cases in your county per 100,000 population, 
uh, and what's going on, frankly, in regard to the hospitals. 68 of our counties are now red. Uh, Franklin and Tuscarora's counties are on our watch list. Today's new red counties are Brown County, Delaware, Erie, Hancock, Jackson, Knox, Miami, Paulding, Seneca, Shelby, Williams, and Wood. Eight of those counties are red for the first time. Uh, in Franklin County and Tuscarora's County, six of the seven alert system indicators were flagged this week. That means if that continues growth, uh, that they would turn purple next week. Um, both counties are seeing a high number of cases, a high percentage of cases spreading in the community and sustained increases in cases and three healthcare utilization measures, emergency room visits, outpatient visits, and hospital admissions of residents uh, with, with COVID. Let's go to an, something that we're going to be introducing. We don't have a slide for this today, <clears throat> but we are introducing something that I think will give you uh, more specific details, particularly if you live in a larger county, and that is the ability to go to your zip code and go right down and see what exactly is going on. We're introducing two new dashboards on the coronavirus website. The first is a zip code dashboard. This latest release of data continues our commitment to giving you the most information we can as soon as we can. Users will be able to view data from their local communities on a map, and they can filter by probable or confirmed case status by county. Uh, there'll be a specific zip code or a time period, uh, such as cases during the past two weeks, 30 days, or the entire pandemic. So you can go down and just drill what I would suggest people do. <clears throat> when you look at this, look at the two weeks, because that gives you what is the last 14 days and gives you an idea of what has been going on. <clears throat> case counts will also be available on a downloadable filter chart sorted from the highest cases to the least. Uh, to protect confidentiality, we aren't showing case counts for zip codes with fewer than five cases or less than 100 total residents. That won't, will not impact most of you. Uh, the next dashboard that we're introducing today is a flu dashboard. Uh, a new flu dashboard that will be on the Department of Health website. This dashboard expands statewide seasonal flu activity that the Department of Health shares each year. So they always put out some information. This is gonna expand it. This dashboard shows flu trends over time with charts that indicate whether flu hospitalizations or cases of flu-like illness are on the rise or decline compared to the previous week and compared to the five-year average to that date. Uh, hospitalization data is broken down by region, county, date, sex, age, race. The data shows only positive flu PCR tests reported by public health laboratories and selected clinical laboratories that participate in the national flu monitoring system. Additional data will be added moving forward. The dashboard will be updated every Friday at 9 a.m. So again, we urge everyone uh, to get a flu shot. It's very early in the flu season. We can't really tell uh, how severe this season yet is going to be, but we ask everybody to get a flu shot and you'll be able to follow th this uh, again and see what's going on in your, in your community in regard to how widespread uh, the flu is. Our health departments have been at the forefront of this battle. Uh, and as we look to the future and see what we have to do uh, to be able to successfully battle this virus, making sure that our 113 health departments have the proper funding uh, is something that's very, very important. And I have committed uh, to every health commissioner in the state uh, that we will be there for them uh, because they're at the front line. Throughout this pandemic, there's been assistance available through CARES Act funding. Um, we're saying today that help is on the way. Uh, with the assistance and the help and the partnership of the state legislature, and I thank them, uh, we're setting aside $30 million to assist Ohio's 113 local health departments. Each department will receive $200,000. Uh, 
Um, and they will have flexibility to determine how best to use these funds as they fight COVID. Um, the remaining money uh, from the 30 million will be used to hire contact tracers to support local health departments. We'll do this at the state level, but then they are available to surge in when a county really needs help. Uh, we're continuing to hire people now, uh, and I've told our team, uh, do it just as fast as we can. Uh, we'll continue to offer state resources and support to help fight COVID-19 at the local level. And again, I want to thank uh, our health departments, every worker out there who's at the front line. Thank you so very, very much uh, for what you're doing. I just got off the phone with Kentucky Governor Bashir. Uh, Andy and I talk quite often. Uh, usually it's about COVID. Today it was about a bridge. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what happened yesterday. Um, crash on the Brent Spence Bridge, of course, is the main transportation corridor between Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky. Uh, damages from the accident are very severe. The bridge is now closed. Um, inspectors were there this morning, could get onto the bridge then, it cooled enough. Uh, that is, is going on at this time. Uh, we expect, I've talked with Jack Marshbanks, the Ohio Department of Transportation. Uh, we expect that uh, review to continue at least into and through Saturday, and we'll see what the inspectors come up with. Uh, we know the importance of this bridge and getting it back up, but we also are dedicated, uh, both governors are dedicated to making sure it's safe and that no one's going to go on there until we're, we feel safe about taking our own families on there. So we ask for patience uh, for people uh, as, we, as we move forward uh, with, with that. Let me now move to uh, Lieutenant Governor, John. Thanks, Governor. Uh, I wanted to just give a quick update uh, and reminder about the Small Business Relief Grant. Uh, we put this, uh, made this available uh, a few weeks ago to employers with 25 employees or less. It's $125 million in which we will provide $10,000 grants to these small businesses for mortgage, rent, utility payments, salaries, wages, the things that you, you need to keep uh, to keep the doors open and, and uh, to keep things moving forward. We set aside $500,000 per county so that it wasn't, uh, so that every county got a chance to participate. Um, and what we found though, where we at right now is we have a few counties that haven't used up their 50 company allocation. Uh, we have 13 counties, Vinton, Harrison, Adams, Hardin, Preble, Noble, Monroe, Fayette, Carroll, Morrow, Brown, Morgan, and Wyandotte. So there's still money available for small businesses uh, in those counties to apply. Uh, we encourage you uh, to go to businesshelp.ohio.gov uh, to apply for those monies. Uh, they're in the process right now of processing those applications and, and getting grants out to businesses. But in, the, in these counties, there's still money available. And so for our friends in the media, if you cover those counties, please help us make sure that the businesses in those communities know about it so that we can uh, make sure that they're getting the assistance that we know they so very much need. I also will add that the, the Bar and Restaurant Assistance Fund is another option where we uh, made available $38 million for $2,500 assistance payments for on-premises liquor permit holders. The Department of Commerce tells me that we've only had about a third of our licensees apply for that money so far, and you can make sure that you get your uh, uh, assistance payment of $2,500 by going to businesshelp.ohio.gov, uh, and this is an opportunity through the Ohio Department of Commerce and the Development Services Agency. Please make sure that you take advantage of those resources as we know, uh, it's difficult for small businesses and everybody during this time. Um, I also um, want to thank everybody who's out there across the state who's sacrificing and working hard. Uh, as of late, uh, healthcare workers, we know uh, how challenging your jobs are. Those that are working in nursing homes, we, we appreciate your efforts. And, and I know our team internally has worked hard at trying to, to deliver information to you, uh, the media, to the public, 
And uh, even the zip code data and the flu data that you, that you now are being made available today uh, through the, the dashboard, all of that is due to the hard work of, of our tech team. And uh, the Center for Digital Government has, has uh, given the state of Ohio an A uh, for the 2020 Digital Survey of States. Uh, there were only five states, check, 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 check. five states to receive an A. And um, I was surprised, frankly, because we're just getting started. We're going to be able to do a lot more to support these efforts. Um, this was triggered uh, with the creation of the Innovate Ohio platform through our team at Innovate Ohio and the governor's executive order last year that required uh, the uh, agencies to put their data on that platform. Thankfully, the Ohio Department of Health was one of the first ones to do it. So that enabled us to, uh, to move their data to the cloud, uh, migrate that data to the, the cloud, which enabled us to create the coronavirus.ohio.gov dashboard, which we uh, have been getting information out to all of you on. Uh, and being one of five states to receive an A, there were only four that were recognized for, their, uh, for, da for data governance and transparency as, as being the top states in the country in Ohio was one of those. So I want to thank the, the data team. They work so hard at the Department of Health with the folks at the Innovate Ohio, uh, the Innovate Ohio team to make sure that they're delivering this information, that they're protecting privacy. Uh, I know we have a long way to go to get where we want to be, but I just wanted to, to thank those teams for what they do to, to help get that information out to people. I hope you'll take advantage of the new data at the zip code level. I find it very interesting and helpful to really gauge what's going on in your community. So uh, thanks, Governor. I'll turn it back over to you. Well, Lieutenant Governor, thank you very much. Thanks for your leadership uh, in regard to this. Uh, governments, I, I think, historically um, don't keep up many times in regard to getting data out. And uh, we have an obligation to get it out to the public. Uh, as you said, John, we have a ways to go. We know that. Uh, but we're proud of at least of the progress that we have made in, in regard to this. And it's important, I think, as people discuss public policy issues to be able to pull down information, whether it's the public, whether it's the news media. Um, and again, we're not perfect. We know we got a long ways to go, but I think by um, what you heard from John, uh, you see that we are making some progress uh, in regard to that. And, uh, you know, the information we're going to continue, as we announced today, with two new dashboards, we're going to continue to try to put information up uh, and make it as just as reliable um, as certainly as we can. Uh, we're ready to go to questions. Governor, first question today is from Jim Province at the Toledo Blade. Hi, hey, Governor. Thanks again for this briefing. Appreciate it. Um, your administration is still in the courts in uh, some cases, uh, appealing decisions by judges that found that you or your health director overstepped your authority when it came to prior orders affecting gyms, et cetera. How would those be affected now by new orders that in some cases might double down on what judges said you, aren't, you don't have the authority to do? Well, I'm going to, I can't really answer that. Um, we've, got, we've been sued a lot. <laughs> I've been sued a lot. And I'm sure that uh, lawsuits will continue. And, and so, you know, we're, appealing those cases where we lost. Uh, we won some cases as well. So, you know, what I can assure you is that any order we issue is done with great consultation uh, with our legal team. We have some very good lawyers and, uh, you know, sometimes judges disagree with what we do. We understand that, we respect that, and we follow the process. And the process means that we can appeal uh, or don't. Um, and, you know, we, we make those decisions based upon what, you know, uh, best counsel advice is and what we think is in the best interest of the people of the state of Ohio. So um, we're, we're not going to make any order in, unless we feel that it is a valid order. Uh, sometimes a judge may disagree, and that's the way the system works. Next question is from Brian Duggar at WTOL in Toledo. Hi, Governor. Right. Uh, you said that you're going to assess bars and restaurants in one week. Now, we know that hospitalizations will likely to continue to go up because they are a lagging indicator. So what numbers are you going to be looking at and what, in your mind, is acceptable progress? Well, you're right. These things, these things lag. 
And there's, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And frankly, I had a choice. I was giving a speech to the people of the state of Ohio. I, I want to be as transparent and as open as possible. I could have not referenced bars uh, last night or, or restaurants, but I wanted to just set it out before the people of the state that this is something that we believe we will have to go to if things continue uh, down the path that they're going. Um, you know, we, we are seeing some spread in bars and restaurants. Um, what's unique about them is that it's more difficult now. You know, they've done a good job. Most bars, most restaurants have done a good job, but they inherently, they're inside generally now this time of year. And there's many times people can't wear a mask and that's what inherently, it's not their fault, but it makes it more dangerous and more dicey, quite frankly. So as we look at this thing, uh, as I said in my opening comments today, we're gonna first talk to our hospitals. We talk to our hospitals all the time. Uh, and we check with them to see what, you know, what they are seeing and how bad the situation is. If you look at today's numbers, I mean, you know, we are, go we are growing this. This is growing at a, just a massive amount. And we're going to have to take the actions that need to be taken. But the t things we talked about yesterday, um, individuals in their own lives taking control of things is still the most important thing that can be done. I can't order that, but people can do that. Uh, and that's where we're seeing significant spread. Retail outlets, we put a mask we order on in July. And yet, unfortunately, we have places in Ohio where you walk in and no one's wearing a mask or very few people are. That's not fair to the employees and it's not fair uh, to the customers. And so we're gonna have to do what we have to do in regard to that. Again, not in a punitive way. Uh, we're going to give warnings, we're gonna talk to people, we're gonna try to get them to, to comply before doing anything, anything punitive uh, at all. Where we've seen a lot of spread, where we've seen these big spread events have been weddings and some funerals. Uh, and so, as I looked at things and we looked at it and all the people I talked to, both inside and outside the administration, we said, what are we going to do? You know, those are two specific things that we came up with that we believe will make a difference. The weddings and funerals coming under, uh, under not that they can't have the, the, the event, the party, the coming together, the wake, whatever, we're not telling people they can't do it. We're just telling them they got to do it in a, in, a, in a safe way. We're saying to <clears throat> retail outlets, it just needs to be safe. We want you to stay open. But we're, I am convinced that the flaring up this virus, I know it's not good for business. And so if we can assure people that they're going to be safe in a business, that a retail outlet they go to, they're more likely to go to that. And it's just in everybody, everybody's interest. And the third thing, again, we didn't say we were going to do it uh, on a certain date. We said, we're gonna look at it. We, we said, look, if things don't change, then in a week, we will have to do this. So that's, that's what we said, but we're constantly monitoring this every day. And we'll, we'll take an answer to your question. It's a totality of all the circumstances. It's not just one number or two numbers. We look at multiple numbers and we look at exactly where we are. For those who say, I don't like your decisions last night or I don't like your idea about bars and restaurants. I understand. <laughs> I fully understand that. I, you know, we don't want to close anything, nothing. But the buck does stop with me. And I can tell you, and medical experts have told me, and hospitals told me, that at the rate we're going, this is not sustainable. We are gonna have very bad consequences when this, if this thing continues to go up at the rate it's going. And just look at how much it's, it, it, it's jumping every single day. So it's not a question, you know, it's not an option. 
the governor doesn't have an option to do something. We have to take action. It would be totally irresponsible at this point not to take actions. Next question is from Jack Windsor at WMFD in Mansfield. Hey, Jack. Hi, Governor. In communication with your Ohio Department of Health, we were told currently, quote, there are many fewer non-COVID respiratory illnesses than usual because of social distancing, mask wearing, and working from home. So two-part question in light of the newly commissioned retail compliance unit you spoke about last night. Uh, if mask, masks work for flu and other respiratory illnesses, why are they not working for COVID? And then the second part of that is, what evidence are you getting to indicate mask compliance levels? The eyeball test or IM shows that almost everyone is masking and has been. Well, Jack, again, I, I, I'm, with all due respect, I disagree with your facts. Um, so you start from a different premise, I guess. Um, masks are being used in some places, um, and at one level in some places, and a different level in other places. There's not, you know, there's no uniformity or consistency. I mean, if I could wave a wand and we were doing 90% mask compliance every place in public, I would say, we got it. It's good. But we're seeing an inconsistency. Why do I think masks work? Every expert uh, that has looked at this says they they work. You go look at look at article after article. But I'll tell you what our own experience in Ohio has been. When in July, several of our mayors put a mask order on in their city, and at the and shortly after that, I put a mask order on for the rest of their county, and for any county that was red at the time. We saw a very quick increase in mask usage. Uh, now this is, look, I mean, this is, this is eyeballing it. This is people out looking. This is what mayors are telling me. This is what um, health commissioners are telling me. Mask compliance went up dramatically at the same time when mask compliance went up, cases went down. There was no other reason for those cases to go down. I mean, there could have been some other variable in there that may have impacted it some, but the biggest variable, the biggest change that we could see was masks were being worn. And so we saw the cases go down um, dramatically. Another example, <clears throat> while there are cases associated with schools, when I talk to superintendents, and when I talk to health departments, um, they believe, and we're doing some studies right now this week and next week and the week after, and we'll have much better day, data. But I'll tell you what they believe. What they believe is that there's not much transmission directly in the classroom from one student to another, one student who has COVID to another student. Why? Well, they're inside. That would indicate there might be transmission. They're sitting there at least for an hour, sometimes for seven hours. Why wouldn't we see it? The only thing we know of is because everybody's wearing a mask. Uh, so these are just things that we know from our own experience in Ohio. And I, I've said this very, a lot of times. When this thing started, you know, we didn't know a lot. And there's still a lot we don't know. But one thing that I think, you know, I, I'm a old prosecutor, former prosecutor, um, we used to say, you know, jury's back. On this issue, on this issue, on mask, the jury is back. And the verdict is mask work and mask are needed. Next question is from Marty Schladen at the Ohio Capitol Journal. Hey, Marty. Hi, how are you, Governor? Good. Um, hopefully, uh, vaccines will start coming online maybe in January if we're really lucky. And I know you're thinking about protecting uh, frontline healthcare workers, which seems totally appropriate. Is there any thought toward pro, uh, prioritizing uh, some lower income people, both because they're working the kinds of jobs where they've got to go face the public and retail, and also because they're living in settings where it's more difficult to uh, socially distance? Yes. Yes, and, and we're still going through that process. I know the federal government's still going through that process. Uh, you know, our, our goal, is, Marty, is to save the most lives we can and to slow the virus down as quickly as we can. So we've looked at, at for example, 
somebody who works in a grocery store. They're exposed to people all day. They may have asthma. They may have be diabetic, but they have to work. And we have a lot of people who are in that category. So yeah, as we put this together and it's not finalized, as we put together this together, that certainly is a group of people, you know, that we would like to be able uh, to get help to through the vaccine uh, as early in the process as, as, as we can. Next question is from John Reed at Gongwar News Service. Good afternoon, Governor. Hey, John. Uh, with, uh, with this latest surge coming just as, I mean, the coronavirus relief fund dollars from the federal government are expiring in the next several weeks, um, how important is it that Congress appropriates more money um, considering costs are probably going to go up because of this? Yeah, this is very important. Uh, I talked to Senator Portman um, yesterday. Uh, I intend to talk to Senator Brown the next day or two. Uh, I've talked to uh, members of the, uh, the House of Representatives. Um, this is very important. Uh, we need a bill. Uh, we need a bill, number one, to allow us to uh, take this money that we already have over beyond December 31st, not have to spend it before December 31st. It would be an inefficient use of the money for us to have to spend it now. Um, so being able to carry that over is very important. Uh, having additional money um, is important as well. So uh, yeah, we, we it's, it's very, very, very important. Um, you know, we are grateful for the help that Congress has given us in the past. We do not have the ability uh, in, in Ohio, we have to balance our budget every year. Um, that's a good thing, but, uh, you know, there's no extra money. There's no, no money to do some of these things that we know really, really need to be done. So we're, we're holding money back. We keep thinking there's probably going to be a bill and that we can move that money over so that we can do testing into next year. Uh, because even though I'm very optimistic, um, of the news this week, we hope to have the first batch of vaccine in, in December, but we know it's going to take a while uh, for that to go out. And all during that period of time, we're gonna to have to continue to wear masks, we're gonna to continue to keep the distance, we're gonna to have to do all the things that we're, you know, we're doing now, and we're gonna to have to continue to test. Uh, and you know, we need money for that testing. Next question is from Jim Adi at WHIO in Dayton. Hey, Jim. Hey, Governor, uh, let's talk about the mechanics of the modified mask order. Uh, first off, has that come out yet? Secondly, uh, how do you envision this working? Your staff from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation, will be will they be going into stores or will this be on a complaint basis? Do you have enough people to realistically enforce this across the state? Well, first of all, Jim, um, what we hope uh, is with this order that and with the great increase in cases that people are seeing. I mean, this is a different ball game today. This is a different world than we had in the spring. This is a different world than we had uh, the, in the summer. Ohio faces a much bigger challenge today. And I think that people, it's time now for people to reassess. And if someone said, look, I, I'm not gonna wear a mask, now's the time to think, you know, I really need to do this. So what we hope is with the new order, with the enforcement uh, threat out there, frankly, uh, that people will comply a lot more. And I think they will. Uh, specifically in regard to your question, you know, the Bureau of Workers' Compensation exists to protect workers. Um, what these agents will be doing when they go out is protecting workers. Uh, we wanna ensure that every Ohio worker, when they go to work, they're in a retail establishment, they're faced, they're looking at people who are wearing a mask also, and not being in a situation where all the employees are wearing masks, but yet people coming in and customers don't have to. That's not fair. It's not fair, it's not right. So what these inspectors will do uh, is they will, they will be going out, they will be going into stores, uh, they will be assessing the situation, they will be meeting with the store manager who's ever in charge on that shift, and kind of talking about, you know, what is going on in these stores. 
um, you know, we need for the stores to continue to make sure that there's not a whole bunch of people in the store. They have to manage that. Uh, at the same time, they have an obligation to see uh, that it's a safe working environment, just like anything else. And wearing a mask is part of that safe environment. Uh, we anticipate they're there to help uh, and to explain. And, you know, the first time they come in that store, they're not going to shut anything down. They, might, they may, depending on the facts, give a warning. If they, when they come back, if we're still the situation is not good, then, you know, they can take uh, at their discretion um, appropriate action to, you know, shut the store down until the store, uh, you know, up to 24 hours. Doesn't mean it always has to be that, but until that store can comply and, and there's a safe environment. Public has a right to have a safe environment. Employees have a right to have a safe environment. That's how we intend to, intend to do it. Next question is from Alex Ebert at Bloomberg. Hey, Governor. Thanks for this uh, opportunity. Alex. I have the, the blessing and the pleasure to cover the Midwest for Bloomberg. And in doing that, I get to see how the governor's try to needle their way between conservatives that are worried about overreach of the government and liberals that are more concerned about, um, you know, not doing things for the equity of poor people in the states in terms of COVID. How do you personally go about making these decisions, trying to get political consensus behind these things? And what are your considerations about trying to keep the political will behind the things that you're doing? Because you're a little bit out of step and ahead of Michigan, Kentucky, and Indiana um, in your, your new mask mandate. Thank you. Well, it's interesting. Um, as you know from your coverage of the Midwest governors, um, you know, sometimes one's been ahead, sometime another. Um, we talk a lot. In fact, we have a call today. I'm looking forward to that call. Um, you know, we're all facing the same issue uh, in the past. Some of our states have been hotter than others now every Midwest state is facing a problem. No one's, no one's got a break now. And so we continue to compare notes uh, and have discussions about what, what we think will work. You know, I've said this before, but what I think about all day is what else should we be doing? What else could we be doing? Um, you know, how do we bring people along in this discussion? Because it's, a, you know, it, when a tornado hits, we see it. We see the damage. We all know that we need to go deal with it. Uh, you know, Ohio River uh, overflows and floods down in southern Ohio and Lawrence County or, or some county. You know, we know what's going on. This virus, you know, it's, it's quiet. Uh, it's secretive. Uh, we just see the casualties. And so it's, it's tougher for people to comprehend. And I think what is difficult now is for people to comprehend how much different this is than it was in the spring, how much different this is than it was in the summer. It's not even close. Uh, and so how I communicate that, um, you know, is, is something I struggle with, I think about. Uh, one thing that we've been doing, and I think it was sometimes misunderstood, and that's probably because I didn't explain it very well, but uh, John Houston and I now have I had, I think, 25 calls with 25 different county leaders. And what we've tried to do uh, is get these leaders not to take my job over or, or for me to duck any responsibility. That's not what we're asking them to do. What we're asking them to do is to help explain to the people in their county exactly what's going on in their county and really what they need to do. And we've had great calls. Uh, I think it's been very successful, and it's been a, a frank exchange of, of ideas. In some cases, it's been things that they needed us to do, and, and we're trying to do those things. In other cases, it was, frankly, us explaining to them exactly what is going on, um, you know, what the numbers do show. And not everybody, everybody's got a busy life. Not everyone knows exactly what's going on. And so it's bringing people together in counties is one way to get back to your question, one way that we try to bring people along uh, because ultimately, you know, I work for the people of the state of Ohio, um, but I owe them 
a frank discussion. We tried to have that frank discussion um, last night. We're carrying on those discussions as we talk to leaders in these Zoom calls uh, all over the state. And I appreciate very much, I want to say this to all of them, the local officials, whether we've got you on the Zoom yet, uh, call or not, uh, but we appreciate everything that you're doing because you're really a key to, um, you know, having the public understand and then carrying out what we need to do at the county level. Next question is from Kenny Bass at WCHS in Charleston, West Virginia. Hi, Governor. Thanks for the opportunity. Since Thank closing you. bars and restaurants in Ohio is still on the table as a possibility, can you share the scientific data and contact tracing that confirms spread is a real problem in those establishments and would drive your decision? And since you regularly share problems with us about weddings, funerals, and churches as major sources of outbreaks, are you considering shutting those things down in order to contain the spread? And finally, if small gatherings of family and friends are major sources of spread, which you've said, why not some type of order limiting those activities and try your luck in court and see what happens? Thank you. Well, you know, we do have still an order on uh, of 10 people gathering together. There's some exceptions, but uh, that order has never gone off. Um, you know, I don't intend to send agents out to knock on people's doors, uh, go into their backyard, uh, go down to their rec room. I mean, you know, we can't, we, we can't do that and we shouldn't do that. So a lot of going back to, you know, previous Alex's question, um, previous question, a lot of it is persuasion. A lot of it is uh, letting people understand what the facts are and so that they can make those, those decisions. Um, so, you know, some of this we can't do and shouldn't do uh, by any kind of mandate. But, uh, you know, as far as the uh, weddings uh, and these events, Look, we're not going to tell someone you can't get married. I'm not going to tell someone they can't bury their loved one or can't have a ceremony. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Not right. Not right. But we can say, look, we're losing people. People are dying as a result of some of these celebrations. And we've had horrible stories. It just breaks your heart. And so telling people, you, yeah, you can do it, but, you know, wear a mask. Stay at the table just like you would at a, at a restaurant. Don't go dance. Don't mingle. Uh, you know, I know that's tough. It's, it goes against kind of our grain, particularly a, a, cel a celebration. But there's other ways of, of, of doing these things. You can have the, the event. And if you want to have a big party, you know, when this thing is over, have a great big party. Uh, there's just there's many alternatives, many ways that people people can can deal with with that. And as far as the evidence from bars, look, I, I looked at some things today. Reports, uh, we've got evidence. There's spread in bars. Uh, there is there is spread in, in in restaurants. Is there spread other places? Absolutely. We got spread all over the place. Um, and I think I've talked a lot about the weddings and funerals, and we're doing something about that. I think I've talked a lot about people coming together in just in informal ways and how dangerous that is. In that case, there's no rule we can issue or should. People, we just have to warn people. These are very dangerous situations. Be careful, particularly for the next two or two, two or two or three months. But yeah, we've got we've got uh, examples of spread that's occurred. And again, as I said at the beginning, when you try to analyze this and say, okay, what can we do to slow this down? And when we know that masks are so very, very important, your attention is naturally drawn to the places where you can't wear a mask. Think of a bar, music is up, and you know people are drinking, they're sitting at the table, but, uh, you know, they, they're not wearing a mask uh, and they're there for some period of time, the same way sometimes with restaurants. So as you just try to logically analyze this, we're not trying to pick on bars and restaurants. You know, I've had members of my family who've been involved in owning bars and owning restaurants. And, and you know, these, these things are the last thing we want to do. Small business. We love small business. My family's been in small businesses. You know, but we have to analyze it from a 
logical approach. And we haven't said we're going to definitely do this, but what I wanted to do, I owed it to the people of the state, people who run bars, people who run restaurants to say, look, we're looking at this and we're concerned about it. John? Yeah, Governor, I, I, I want to just add to this that, you know, hopefully the message that you're hearing from us is that we're trying to give people every single tool we can to help them help us make sure we keep things open. But we also can't be tone deaf to the, to the hospitals who we talk to, who, who tell us that their staffs are stressed, that some already have pulled back on elective surgeries and, and not you know, fully prepare the people of Ohio for <laughs> that reality too. So what we're asking is just do things the right way. Uh, use those masks, try to avoid events if you can avoid them, pull back on these things a little while until we get this back under control so that we don't have to get ourselves to a point that we, we have to shut anything down because we don't want to, but we, we have to recognize the reality of what our, our healthcare professionals are facing and the implications to people's health and livelihoods and, and try to find that balance. And hopefully we're communicating that. That's why we give you the data. That's why we, we try, this is a communications exercise, getting information, because my experience is, is that if everybody has the same information, they'll usually come to the same conclusion. And we hope that this information will help people understand the pressures that people in the healthcare system are going through right now and, and uh, how we all have to try to help each other out. Next question is from Dan DeRose at WOIO in Cleveland. Uh, Governor and Lieutenant Governor, uh, thanks for the opportunity. I don't want to take too much more time on bars and restaurants. I do just want to say that I've been contacted almost immediately after your your um, your uh, news conference yesterday uh, from restaurant owners, namely uh, one in, sm in a small restaurant in East Canton, who said if they go through a shutdown again, that that'll be it, that they'll never be able to reopen again. Uh, I do want to talk about doses. You were on uh, CBS this morning uh, in a live interview, and you talked about uh, it was the first time you've put a number on what you think our first delivery of a vaccine will be. You said 30,000 uh, Pfizer, that's a double dose. So that that really knocks it down to 15,000 people uh, will be the first to get the doses when it comes to Ohio. And you said it would be spent uh, on our nursing home staff, 15,000 out of 11.7 million people, but yet you keep telling us to have hope. 15,000 versus 11.7 million doesn't sound like a lot of hope. Uh, Dan, there's hope out there. There's a vaccine apparently uh, that has been developed that was 90% uh, worked. Uh, and that's, that's very, very good news. Um, Here's what we've been told. We've been told that the third, first batch will be 30,000. Um, because we believe other batches will be right behind that, that really is 30,000. Uh, we assume the second shot will come right behind that. Now, again, this is it's a work in progress and we're just, we're just relaying, I'm just relaying to you what the federal government is relaying to us, but we hope that this comes very quickly in batches right after that. Some of these batches, some of this, the federal government is going to send directly to places in Ohio. Some of it we believe is going to come through us and we will make sure it is, it is distributed. So I can't tell you how fast this will come out. Uh, I'm hearing the same things that you're hearing. Uh, you know, Dr. Fauci was on this morning. He was talking about spring uh, when, you know, we would have a significant distribution I've also heard July as far as significant distribution. I don't know, but I do know it's coming. And I do know, uh, or at least feel that it's going to be a lot of it coming our way, just as it is in every, every other, other state. So that is the hope that is out there. And uh, I think we have to have hope. I think it's realistic hope. I've tried to be real, realistic throughout this. But I've also, as I indicated last night, we have a long winter ahead of us. And this is the time for us to take that deep breath and say, hey, we can make it to the finish of this marathon. We can do it. We've come a long way. 
um, we've sacrificed a lot. Now's not the time to lose the opportunity to make it uh, and, and, and to be able to celebrate, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's hope maybe a, a World Series in Cleveland or a World Series in Cincinnati and, you know, whatever you love to do uh, or, or just being with your kids and your, or your grandkids. You know, we all have a lot to live for. Let's get through this. And here's what we got to do to do it because this virus is threatening us and we are tougher than the virus and we just need to push back. And we know we have the tools in our hands to fight back and we, we can do that. So I don't think it's false hope. It's hope. It's realistic hope. Next question is from Jackie Borchert at the Cincinnati Inquirer. Good afternoon, Governor. Um, experts have told me that it will take longer than one week for this to tamp down, even if everyone were to just right now at this moment, do 100% of the things that you've been asking them to do. So should Ohioans take your one week warning as a one week notice that businesses will start to close next week? How much notice do you plan to give businesses and what financial aid will be available if there are closures? Jackie, thank you for the, for the question. Um, look, we're facing a, a, a monumental crisis in this state. Uh, and I will say it again, you know, this is not, would not be a decision that I would make lightly, but we have to do some things to slow this down. So if we can get mask wearing up this week, if we can see things move in our direction, yes, we can, we can postpone that and we may never have to do it, but we've got to see movement. We've got to see something that indicates that we can slow this thing down. Because doing the same thing time after time is not going to slow it down. And unlike the spring, spring we, things were shut down. We flattened the curve, we got back up, we opened things up, we moved forward. In the summer, we put masks on. That's what knocked it down in the summer. Now everybody's tired. I understand, I'm tired. Everybody's sick of it. But we got to get back up one more time. And we got to be able to do it. And so if we can start making some progress in that direction, then yes, we don't want to close anything down. We didn't run for governor to close stuff down. That's not what we want to do, but we're going to do what we have to do. Um, and what I'm asking the people of Ohio to do, put your mask on, stay, um, be careful. Don't go to that party. Now, these are things that we can do now and we will see pretty quick results. We can do that. Next question is from Joe Ingalls at Ohio Public Radio and Television. Good afternoon, Governor. Hi, Joe. Um, hi. We've been hearing cases of people who live with someone who's COVID positive. They're supposed to be quarantining, um, but they're not because they don't feel sick. They're not showing symptoms. They don't have paid sick leave, fear of losing their job, and they believe the pandemic is politically motivated. They continue to go to work, sometimes in places like hospitals and nursing homes where people could easily get this. Uh, what can be done to make sure those who should be quarantining due to exposure, exposure are actually doing it? Yeah, Joe, quarantines are done at the local level. They're done by 113 health departments. I mean, I think my job, our job is to continue to try to appeal to them and continue to um, you know, message to them. I mean, I know that the last thing anyone wants to do is to hurt someone else or to kill someone else. Uh, and certainly they don't want to do that to someone they know or someone even they don't know. So I think bringing home the reality of how, how this spreads is just very, very important. And I think we all have, all of us have an obligation to do that. I've asked the mayors to do it. I've asked the county commissioners to do it. But this is, this is a persuasion. You know, part of what this is, is bringing people along and letting them understand the gravity of the situation that we're in today. That's what I'm trying to do. Next question is from Kevin Landers at WBNS in Columbus. Hello, Governor. Kevin. Thank you for taking it, uh, for doing this again. Um, masks and stay-at-home orders have been, seems the most effective ways to reduce the spread. And if cases are skyrocketing and hospitals are stressed out, why not take that drastic measure 
and do another stay at home order if we are in such dire straits now? And do you believe that the state has an obligation to pay back revenues for those businesses who may have to close as a result? Thank you. Well, I'll leave that up to the lawyers. Um, second part of the question. Uh, let me talk. take the first one. I saw a headline uh, today. I always look at the front pages of all the major newspapers in the state. And uh, I know the writers have told me that uh, they don't write the headlines and sometimes headline writers have to squeeze stuff in. But uh, there's one talking about a shutdown. We're not talking about a shutdown. We're not talking about a shutdown of the state. Uh, what we're talking about is, is, is trying to uh, do what we have to do so our hospitals can stay open so our kids can stay in school. Our grandparents who are in nursing homes or great grandparents who are in those nursing homes can be safe. That's what, that's what frankly, this is, this is all about. Uh, but we're not looking at a shutdown. And the reason we're not looking at a shutdown is we know the cost. I don't just mean economic cost. I mean the personal human cost that goes with a shutdown. Um, mental health problems have gone up significantly since this virus hit. Um, we've lost more people to drug overdoses because people are alone. Uh, one theory is that they're more alone. And if they overdose, there's no one there to help them. There's no one there to call 911. There's no one there to help. Um, we know with a shutdown, kids who are in school, who need to be in school, can't be in school. Uh, we know that when we had the previous shutdown, uh, that we had fewer cases of child abuse reported. I don't think there was less child abuse. I think there just weren't teachers to look at these kids and make a determination there might be child abuse and report it to the local children's services. So tremendous penalty, tremendous damage is done when there's a shutdown. Uh, you know, we may come to that, I suppose, but that is not what we want to do. And particularly when we have it within our own power to avoid that. So I guess if there's one message from today, I would like to leave with everyone. We have it within our own power to avoid these bad consequences, either of a shutdown uh, or of this virus just running wild through the state of Ohio. We can control it by what each one of us does. Next question is from Jeff Reddick at WSYX in Columbus. Jeff, you on there? Sorry, can you hear me now? Uh, got you now. We got you. Thank now. you. Uh, good afternoon to you. I, I know it probably feels sometimes like you don't have a lot of allies in this process. Um, the Ohio Restaurant Association today said any discussion of another restaurant closure would be inconsistent with any science or contact tracing data that we have been provided. That's a quote from their release. I know earlier you said that you've seen data about bar and restaurant spread and contact tracing, but we haven't seen that. Will you commit to release that to not only the restaurants, but to the public so it can be evaluated by people? Well, we're going to tell you what we see. Um, yeah, I mean, we're happy to tell you what we see. Um, as I've talked about a number of times on this press conference before, um, the data is collected at the local level. And it is not set up in a way that you can come up with mathematical precision. Uh, but we do know the power of masks. We know that in bars and restaurants, uh, you cannot wear a mask at certain points, certainly when you're eating, certainly when you're drinking. Um, so we, we know those for facts. I looked, just looked at some reports, uh, and there were cases in there that came, they felt came from restaurants. What you have many, many times and came from bars. Um, I, I think what you, you need to understand, the public needs to understand is that it is so widespread today that many times someone is at five or six different places and they can't, they can't really trace it down to one place. So, you know, that, that is something that is, is just a, is a fact. But do we have indication that it spread? Sure. Uh, it's not the only place it spreads. It spreads other places, too. But it certainly it spreads in restaurants, and it's going to spread more uh, as people get more inside. Uh, I, I, could, I, could just, I just want to add that 
Look, we've been doing weekly phone calls with the Restaurant Association. Uh, I will be uh, in a conversation with them this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, we are working with them uh, to find every collaborative way that we can to reduce the spread of the virus, uh, to uh, just take a collaborative, constructive approach with them. So we will continue to listen to the restaurant owners and the bars and and uh, get the best information and try to get on the same page with the data that we are both looking at as we work through this process. Next question is from Ben Schwartz at WCPO in Cincinnati. Hi, Governor. Um, Hi, Ben. I have an email here from a WCPO viewer who says they see police officers not wearing masks in areas where everyone else is required to. They've asked these officers why they aren't, uh, to which they reply, they don't have to wear one while on duty. In this viewer's words, they quote, remain concerned that these law enforcement officers' choices are posing a danger to the public. They say they've reached out to your office about this with no response. So I'm just wondering if you're able to address these concerns. Uh, we'll take a look at that. I mean, you know, my first reaction to that is that that is a matter that uh, was within the jurisdiction of that police department. Uh, there may be a legitimate reason why they're not wearing masks, uh, but we'll look at it. We'll look at it. Next question is from Matt Wright at WJW in Cleveland. Ordered that contact tracing. Matt, hey Matt, I yes. missed your first, you just came on. So okay. we missed the first few words. Okay, thank you. Just again on the contact tracing, you have said previously that local health officials have been reporting that contact tracing shows COVID-19 largely spreading at private gatherings of family and friends and not at bars and restaurants. So has that changed? What new evidence are you basing your closure decision on? Okay, I don't think I ever said um, that it was not spreading at bars and restaurants. Uh, what I've said is I've tried to communicate to people in Ohio that we have a problem and that the problem lies within their own hands uh, and that there is spread that's occurring um, inadvertently, obviously, when people are with friends, people with family, people who are, when they're with others uh, that they're close to, um, they let their guard down. And so I've, I've kind of gone out of my way to try to make that point, but to, to inform people that they can control a lot of this. But we have spread a number of places. But when you look at a bar and you look at a restaurant, there is a reason <laughs> that other states, I mean, we are not alone in talking about closing bars and restaurants. There is a reason that other states have gone and closed bars and restaurants or, or curtailed them. Other states, by the way, have been more prohibitive in regard to how many people can be in a restaurant. Um, all we've done is said a distance. Uh, most state, many states have gone to 25%. Some have gone to 50%. So we've tried throughout this to, to balance this and understanding the great needs that bars and restaurants have uh, and the people who work there and the owners People run the places. We, we, we understand there's a lot at stake here. And we understand also they've been hit very hard and that the pandemic itself has slowed down the number of people who, who want to go out. But, um, you know, we've never said that there's not, there's not spread at bars and restaurants. Next question is from Randy Ludlow at the Columbus Dispatch. Hey, Randy. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, given the the rate at which cases uh, have risen, uh, we went and only took a week to go from 4,000 cases to 6,000. Now it's taken two days to go to 7,000. Uh, given how swiftly this is growing, is it wise to tell Ohio that there will not be any more widespread shutdowns or stay-at-home order? Uh, Randy, if I said that, um, I didn't mean to say it like that. Let me, let me kind of state it the way I think from what I'm seeing. Uh, we don't want to have a shutdown. We want to avoid a shutdown. We can avoid a shutdown. 
And the way we can avoid a shutdown is if all of us are very careful. We can do most of the things that we've always done, but we cannot do them the same way. We have to do them differently. We have to do them wearing a mask. We have to do them with some distance. Um, so it's not that it's not a never, but it is, this is within our control. We don't have to let it get that bad. We don't have to let it get to the point where our hospitals are stacked up. We don't have to get, let to, get to the point where our hospitals can't do other types of surgeries. These are things we can avoid. We have it within our power to do. And I think we need to try that before we get to the point, the, the absolute drastic uh, nuclear bomb of, of, of you know, shutting down again. Uh, we, don't, we really don't want to shut down again. But do I rule that out? No, I can't rule anything out. I, you know, we have to base our decisions every day on what kind of facts that we are seeing. But you're absolutely right, Randy. This thing is rolling through Ohio. Uh, really fast. Next question is from Scott Hallis at the Xenia Daily Gazette. Hey, Scott. Hey, Governor. How are you? I'm well, sir. Good. Thank you for uh, taking our questions. Uh, after uh, last night's um, speech to the uh, to the state, I had gotten a couple emails from a couple of gym owners and even a couple of uh, people who run dance studios who I know, and they they want to know and and maybe the order will contain all this. But when you say employees and customers have to be wearing masks are there still going to be exemptions for people who are in a gym while they're actively working out that they don't have to wear a mask or if someone's teaching a dance class to you know eight or nine people while they're actively doing that you know are they going to be exempt from having to wear a mask or is this going to be a 100 percent you know mask all the time type of order well our mask order uh enforcement side and, and the, the additions that we just added to it uh, really are, are focused on retail outlets uh, more than dance studios or more than uh, fitness centers. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, at least for the time being, uh, the current order in regard to fitness centers and dance studios remains at this point. So there's not, there's not really a change. The only thing I would ask is just people be careful. If you can wear a mask in those situations, you know, that is obviously a lot safer. But, you know, when we talked about what we might have to do in the future with bars and restaurants, um, fitness centers, a lot does, a lot of that is based upon the fact that people are not wearing masks. So for now, in answer to the, your folks question, it's the same. Next question is from Tanisha Johnson at Spectrum News. I think we lost Tanisha. We'll move on to uh, Eric Halperin of WCMH in Columbus. I'm here. Go ahead, somebody. If I may, Governor, um, thank you for taking my question. Um, with cases rising, and as you've noted, um, it being on a massive level and hospitals trying to manage capacity, how close do you feel we are, have you heard, in terms of having to use any sort of overflow space that was initially set up in the beginning for patients? Um, are we anywhere near that? And then in any conversations that you've had, um, how might that now be managed since um, healthcare workers are already exhausted? Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, as we talked about last night, the exhaustion of the healthcare workers and the fact that this is now hitting throughout the Midwest, throughout the northern part of the country, and in every county in Ohio makes it very different than it was in the spring and in the summer. So the, besides just the number of hospitalizations going up dramatically, uh, it's that it's everywhere. So there's no place where we can turn and say, hey, because <laughs> some of the nurses from this part of the state come over to this part. We can't do that. Um, so this is managed and managed very well uh, by, by our hospitals. We set up the three zones early on. Uh, you know, they did a very good job in conjunction many times with the, the um, uh, Ohio National Guard in 
having the build out or the proposed build out, build out or the plans for the build out. So they're ready to go out. But, you know, what you're going to see first, the first warning sign uh, we have started to see when, when the Cleveland Clinic made the decision to pull back for a few days, at least, on some elective surgery, surgeries where someone had to spend the night. And the reason they had that line is because it's the bed. <laughs> it's a precious bed. And, and so, you know, those will be, that's the early warning sign. And then these hospitals, and we'll keep you informed and the hospitals will keep you informed as, as we move forward about exactly what stage that we're at. But, but you're right, it's, it's the people, and the people we really worry about. They're tired, uh, they're our heroes, and there's only, how much more can we ask of them? Next question is from Eric Halperin at WCMH in Columbus. Governor, good afternoon. Thanks for taking the time today. Um, going back to retail and this uh, reissuing of the order, I know you say this is to protect both the employees and the customers. I was talking to the Franklin County Chamber of Commerce today, and they say that you know both between their members, um, employees and customers, they're seeing 95% compliance. Um, I know that's just Franklin County and Central Ohio, but if they're seeing that high of compliance, where are the issues that you're seeing now? Well, not everybody's at 95. Um, you know, it's a big state. It's a diverse state. People have different attitudes, cultures of looking at things. And so if it was 95%, we wouldn't be talking about it. If it was 95% across the state of Ohio, I would not be talking about it. Uh, it's not 95% across the state. I wish it was. Uh, it's very inconsistent. And uh, what we're trying to do is just get, get it up in the neighborhood of 95%. You know, what we're trying to do. Governor, next question is the last question for today. And it belongs to Jess Harden of MahoningMatters.com. Hello. Hi, Governor. Um, as you're aware, Mahoning Matters is currently in mediation with ODH over zip code data for the Mahoning Valley. Our public rec record requests first filed in May were ignored and then rejected. If more people had had this information six months ago to make better decisions, could that have mitigated the surge? And if your answer is no, why release it now saying you want to give the most information when we can? Uh, Jess, I don't know. Um, look, I'll, I'll look at that uh, myself. I'm, I'm not aware of that, so I apologize. But I'll get back to you, and our team will get back to you. Um, I don't. I don't really know. So. Well, we have, uh, I'm sure, good news for everyone. Uh, Fran is here to tell us some good news about the Ohio Imagination Library, and uh, a, a milestone that. Uh, they were able to reach in the last uh, last few days, Fran. Thank you, it's good to be here, um, especially with a little good news. Um, I'm, I'm so pleased to announce that the Ohio Governor's Imagination Library is now, as of this week, statewide, which means that every child from the time they're born until they turn five years old is eligible to receive a book in the mail every single month, no matter what county they live in. Uh, you know, we partner with the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. And when we started, there was only a handful of counties that offered the books and about 13% of our eligible kids were getting them. But today, all 88 counties are eligible and we have about 34% of the kids that are getting the free books each month. We have a little video. It's hard to believe the Ohio Governor's Imagination Library program is a year old. When we began the program, partnering with Dolly Parton Imagination Library last summer, the program was available in pockets of Ohio, in certain zip codes, in certain cities. But Mike and I believe that every Ohio child under the age of five should benefit from getting these free Imagination Library books in the mail every single month. As grandparents, we've seen our grandkids' excitement receiving the Imagination Library books in Greene County. So over the past year, one by one, we worked on partnerships to add more counties. I've really enjoyed meeting with our county partners. 
and parents. My name is Peyton Tolbert. And my name is Wendaya Tolbert. So every day we read at morning and at night, so we brought a special book, The Rain Bear. She loved getting things in the mail. She loved reading it. We would instantly sit down and have to read every single time. So for us, my Imagination Library experience through my daughter has been incredible and absolutely a treasure in our lives. And I like the variety of the books that the Imagination Library sends. They may be books that either weren't on my radar or books that I may not have chosen for them myself. And then to watch them become some of our kids' favorite books is really fun to watch. Oh, it's my new book again. It's definitely a privilege to be a partner with Ohio Governor's Imagination Library. What I really, really appreciate about the books that he's received is um, really just the diversity that you see and very coincidentally just today we um, just got this book the ring bearer so um, we haven't even read it yet but i'm really excited about that and i was really excited to see uh you know kids of color on that cover they helped us to connect as a family and learn more about things around us like baking this is one of our favorite books and about numbers and about forest animals all different kinds of trucks Train. and trains. Which one did you pick? Ooh, the little engine that could. We got that from the Imagination Library. Our goal for the Ohio Governor's Imagination Library in Geauga County is to get as many families and community leaders involved as possible. We want to inspire a love of learning. When we encourage kids to read for pleasure, they become lifelong learners. And that's ultimately what we want for our community. Why do you like to read before bed? Because it's so fun. Because <laughs> it's so fun. Our local communities are just kind of coming together and figuring out ways to um, put these books in children's hands. And all seven of our counties are in Appalachia. And as we build stronger communities, we're building a stronger Ohio. Kids who read succeed. Success is what we're bringing. Reading is an instrument, but it's success we're bringing to your county, success we're bringing to your economy, it's success that we're bringing to all of Ohio together. It's also about uh, their imagination. So to see them take what they've read and then later play um, using some of the characters or the lessons in the story, I think those are all things that go just beyond reading for the sake of getting from a beginning of a book to an end of a book. Also, I really like the snuggles that come along with story time. <laughs> <laughs> Ditto. To the Imagination Library, thank you for creating this program. We truly appreciate finding ways to connect with our children and also increasing literacy in the home. So, bye-bye, guys. And I really like this one. Oh, yeah. And that's your, that says kindergarten, here I come, because you're starting what? Kindergarten. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. Thank you. We've been able to put more books in the hands of Ohio's children during these very, very challenging times, thanks to the support of the General Assembly and also to our partners statewide. To sign up, please visit ohioimaginationlibrary.org. Um, actually, just today, our little four-day-old granddaughter, Meg, was signed up for the Imagination Library. So we hope you'll go sign up your kids and your grandkids. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, we'll be back here uh, at 2 o'clock on Tuesday. Have a good day, everybody. <laughs>